Okay, so we're going to find all the real solutions to this equation. So we're looking for all the real numbers x1, x2, up to x10, so that this equation is satisfied. And there's a really nice algebraic argument which will follow. And just to help us with some initial algebraic manipulations, let's just assume that if these two quantities are equal to each other, let's say that they're equal to some real number a. So this will help us when we do some algebraic manipulation just to extract some more information from the equations. So you can see that a is equal to the square root of something, so this is going to be greater than or equal to zero. So even though we've got a cube root which could be negative, because this has got to be equal to this square root, our a has to be non-negative. And now we can take each of these equations, the square root of all of our terms squared equals a, and we could just square both sides of this. So this gives us x1 squared plus x2 squared and so on up to x10 squared has got to be equal to a squared. And we could do something very similar with our second equation here. We can cube both sides, giving us x1 cubed plus x2 cubed and so on up to x10 cubed is equal to a cubed. So now this first equation is actually quite restrictive on our x values if we look at this, because let's say for example if we had a really big value of x1, let's say x1 was bigger than a, then our x1 squared would be bigger than a squared, and then we're adding lots of non-negative terms here, so it would end up being bigger than a if any of our x terms were bigger than a. So we actually need all of our x terms to be less than or equal to a here, so they all need to be quite small so that when we add all of these terms squared we don't get something that's too big. We don't have quite the same restriction with our cubed terms because these could be negative and we could make it equal to a cubed even if we had some quite large or some quite small values there. So now let's combine these two equations and we'll be able to get a third equation which can give us some more insight into this problem and we can use this restriction on the values of our x's to extract even more information here. So we can take our first equation here, this is equal to a squared, and then we'll just multiply everything here by a, so that now the right hand side is equal to a cubed, and we've got a times x1 squared plus a x2 squared and so on, up to a times x10 squared is equal to a cubed, just multiplying both sides of this first equation by a. So then if we have these two equations, let's label them a and b. We can use the usual simultaneous equations trick of doing a minus b, so we take away the left-hand side from the left-hand side of a here, and then take away the right-hand side of b from the right-hand side of a, we get first of all x1 cubed minus a times x1 squared. So we've got x1 cubed minus a x1 squared, then we've got plus x2 cubed minus a x2 squared and so on, all the way up to x10 cubed minus a times x10 squared, and this is equal to a cubed minus a cubed, so this is equal to zero. And I'll just put each of these terms in brackets, in pairs like this, we've got our x1 terms, x2 terms, up to our x10 terms, and you can see here we could actually factorise out x1 squared from our first bracket, so we've got x1 squared goes into x1 minus a plus then x2 squared can be factorised here, left with x2 minus a in a bracket, and so on up to x10 squared into x10 minus a, and all of this is still equal to zero. So now if we combine this with the information that we've got quite restrictions on what our different values of x can be here compared to a, we can think again, we've got a sum of lots of different terms, and each of these different terms, when we add them all together, it's got to give us a total of zero. So one solution here is just that all of the terms are equal to zero, that's very simple. But let's imagine if some of the terms weren't zero, then in order for the sum to all be zero you'd have to have some of them would be positive and some of them would have to be negative to cancel out. So let's imagine this first term was positive, then perhaps this means that our second term has got to be negative so that when we add them all together we still end up with zero as our solution. So this doesn't seem like too much of a problem, but let's explore this a little bit further. So let's say, for example, that we have a positive term, so that means we've got to have a negative term as well. And if we have a negative term, this means we've got to have a positive term. So if we say that we have one of the terms, xi squared into xi minus a, is positive, 
well, xi squared is always going to be positive, so this is really saying that our xi minus a term is positive. So this is telling us that xi is greater than a. But you can see here, this is a problem with our initial equation here, because if one of our x terms is greater than a, then our xi squared is going to be greater than a squared, which means that the sum of all of these is going to be too big. So we can actually make this a little bit more formal as a proof by contradiction. So we know that a squared is equal to x1 squared, the sum of this up to x10 squared. We know this is greater than or equal to any individual term squared, or xi squared. Then if we've got that xi is greater than a, then our xi squared has got to be greater than a squared. So you see we have a squared is greater than itself, which is a contradiction. So this is telling us then that actually we can't have any positive terms then. So none of these terms in the sum can be positive. And if we don't have any positive terms, this means that we can't have any negative terms because in order for the sum to be zero, we need to have some positive terms to cancel out with the negative terms and vice versa. So we can actually conclude then that all of these terms have just got to be equal to zero. So we can say all of our xi squared into xi minus a have got to be equal to zero. So this is for all values of i between 1 and 10. And now we can use this equation to tell us what values xi is allowed to take. So in order for this to be equal to zero, we would need either xi equal to zero, or we'd need xi equal to a for the bracket term to be equal to zero. So this gives us two possibilities for each of our xi's. We either have xi is equal to zero, or we've got xi is equal to a. So if one of our xi terms is equal to a, then let's just have a look at this equation with the sum of all of our x terms squared. This has got to be equal to a squared. So if one of our xi terms is actually equal to a squared, then we're adding a load of other things being squared. That means that all of our remaining x terms have just got to be equal to zero, otherwise the left-hand side would be too big. And there's also the possibility that actually all of our x's are equal to zero, in which case you would just have zero squared, zero squared, so actually a would have to be equal to zero in that case. So our solutions look like this. So for example, if it was our x1 that was equal to a, then our solution would look like a, zero, zero, all of our other x terms would be equal to zero, or we could have our x2 was equal to a, and so on, so everything else would have to be equal to zero, and we could go up to our x10 term could be the one that's equal to a, and everything else would have to be equal to zero. And there's also the possibility that actually all 10 of the terms are equal to zero, in which case a is equal to zero. So just to describe this family of solutions then, we can say that our solutions are of the form where one of our xi's is equal to a, which is some real number greater than or equal to zero, and then all of the other terms x, j have got to be equal to zero. So this is for all j which are not equal to i. And you'll see that this includes, first of all, all the cases where a is non-zero. We can have an a in any of our different terms here. But it also, because a is allowed to be greater than or equal to zero, we also cover this case where all 10 of our xi terms are equal to zero. So we get this family of solutions then, we can have one of our xi terms is equal to some positive or non-negative number a, and all of the other terms have got to be equal to zero. And there's also this solution where all 10 of the terms are zero.